glad to be here tonight to talk to you all um, about the beautiful animals that I've been studying out on the Channel Island. So I'm going to talk to you about a project um, that I'm working on in collaboration uh, with my colleague Tanya Schwartz um, at Auburn University in Alabama. So uh, many of, may, of you may know that there's this phenomenon worldwide um, that we see um, throughout sort of time and space that species tend to change in body size when they colonize islands. Um, I've got a couple of examples for you here um, of gigantism, um, where you become larger upon colonizing an island. Um, this is in a um, porcupine-like uh, species that became, um, and the mainland ancestor is about this size. The island one is about this size. It didn't have spines, fortunately. I don't know if there are any people around to encounter it, but that's pretty much the largest porcupine you probably want to encounter. Um, and this little rodent-like guy um, got considerably larger on his island. So there's this trend towards gigantism in some species, um, but then other species go the opposite direction. So dwarfism is, a, is another uh, common phenomenon where you can see here um, an elephant, a uh, member of the elephant family, uh, becomes considerably smaller on islands. And here's a hippo um, that is highly miniaturized um, in the island form. Now, this has been observed um, for a long time. And in the 1950s, um, people began to theorize about this. And um, Foster and Van Valen um, developed something they called the island rule, which suggested that large species, uh, when they get to islands, tend to get smaller. And small species um, tend to get larger. Now, there's been some debate in the literature about how consistent this trend always is in different groups. Um, but certainly, it's true that we see this pattern of changing body size on islands over and over um, in the natural world. Now, there's a variety of different hypotheses for why this happens. Um, and I'm just going to outline a couple of the major ones. Um, so one of the major hypotheses, or two of the major hypotheses for gigantism, is that um, when you colonize an island, you may experience either competitive or predatory relief. So on the left there, um, I've got uh, a, a cartoon mainland population. And the species we're going to focus on here is this little rodent. And you can notice there, it's got a few different potential competitors for food or maybe for, for shelter. Um, but when it moves out to the island, often islands have just a small sampling of the species that were there on the mainland. And so the idea here is maybe there's fewer competitors um, for the same amount of resources. And so um, that can facilitate the evolution of larger body sizes, which are able to take advantage of this higher resource availability. Um, uh, predatory re release um, sort of works in a little bit of a different way. Um, here you notice that there's, um, I have at least a couple predators um, of these little mice. Um, there may be fewer predators um, out on islands, so there may be less selection to be small and be able to hide in cracks and more freedom to explore larger body sizes. So, those are a couple major hypotheses for gigantism. On the other hand, dwarfism, um, one of the major hypotheses for that, it has to do with um, the potential for reduced resource availability um, when you colonize an island. Um, and this is actually something we often see um, in ungulates like this elk here. Um, so here the idea is that on the mainland there might be a, a, a wide range of food sources um, that uh, this individual can exploit. But once these populations colonize the island, there may be reduced food resources. So they might be, that might fluctuate over time. So they might not always be available in the way that you have sort of a buffer if there's multiple species around to eat. So that over time, selection would favor species that have smaller body sizes and are more efficient um, at um, operating uh, given limited resources. So uh, sort of the first top part of my talk, I want to um, suppose focused on just evidence that this body size evolution that we see worldwide has actually happened um, on our Channel Islands. Just um, giving a few uh, cameo looks at some of the giants and the dwarves that we have out here. Um, the second part of my talk, I'll go into more um, what specific kinds of questions you want to ask 
um, about some of these dwarves in particular. So um, some of you may have heard that there used to be a giant island deer mouse out there. Um, and when I first heard that, I think I pictured a very large mouse. <laughs> um, but if you look at these, um, these bones, you can see this is the mainland um, deer mouse, and this is the giant. It's bigger, but not hugely bigger. You can have the great run into it. Um, same for these, um, these uh, femurs. Um, so this, this particular mouse is thought to have gone extinct around the time um, that the Chumash came and that the mainland deer mouse ended up colonizing that area, um, perhaps due to um, competition with that with the, the mainland mouse. Um, another extinct um, dwarf that we once had out on the islands is the pygmy mammoth. Um, there were actually two mammoths out there, one regular size and one pygmy, uh, but another spectacular example of, of dwarfism. Um, so the, those are both extinct, um, but today, of course, you all know, I'm sure if you're um, fans of the Channel Islands, that we've got a very char charismatic little dwarf out there, the island fox, um, which is about the size of a house cat. It's gone, undergone a, a very noticeable body size reduction. Every time I go out to the islands and see them, I'm always surprised again how small they are. Um, we also have a giant out there. Um, we've got the island scrub jay, which in many ways looks very similar to the western scrub jay we have here on the mainland. Um, but they are noticeably bigger out there. Um, and they have a number of other interesting characteristics um, as well. Um, this here is the other dwarf um, that actually brought me out um, to the island, the Santa Cruz Island gopher snake. Um, this animal was first described as being dwarf um, in the 1940s. Um, and uh, I, when I heard about it, uh, I was, uh, I had just moved here around five years ago and I was, had some research projects elsewhere, but I was interested in starting something more local. Um, and I became very excited because my background is in life history evolution, trying to understand how different body sizes, reproductive rates, and lifespans evolve across species. And so this seemed like a great opportunity to explore those kinds of questions. I'm in a little dwarf living um, just across the water um, from Santa Barbara. Um, so I uh, started to go out to the islands, um, focusing primarily on uh, Santa Cruz um, and Santa Rosa Island, two, two islands where the, the gopher snake is known to occur. It's also known to occur on San Miguel Island. Um, and I wanted to compare it to some mainland sites with um, regular sized um, gopher snakes. And so I started to set up um, study sites in, in the Santa Monica Mountains um, and then also way up here um, in San Mateo County. Um, as we'll see later, I ended up setting a few other species that, um, and all of them are present here, that, but only a couple of them are present here, um, but, but even though they're out on the island. Um, so just a little bit to make sure you, you know what reptiles are out there um, in general, I just want to um, review those with you. So there's actually only three um, species of lizards in the Northern Channel Islands. Um, and two species of snakes. So the island fence lizard is a subspecies of the same um, lizard species that you probably have in your um, front yard um, if you live around here. Uh, they're very common in sort of suburban, uh, semi-wild areas. But they're a little bit distinctive, particularly this uh, um, turquoise blue coloration, really striking in the island population. It, it, uh, on the mainland or? On the island, yeah. So yeah, keep an eye out for them. They're, they're often on logs or fence posts um, during along. Um, another species that's out there that's also um, very common on the mainland, though less so in urban areas, um, is the side blotched lizard, named after this little spot side. And, uh, and then there's the southern alligator lizard, another one which you may have occasionally um, encountered in your yard. Um, they're sort of a bigger sometimes more snake-like uh, looking lizard because they've got very short um, limbs. So as I was out looking for um, the gopher snakes, I encountered a lot of these reptiles, particularly um, the southern alligator li lizard and the western yellow-bellied racer, the other snake species that lives out there. Um, and as I be began to capture more and more of them, I started thinking, huh, these guys seem kind of small too. Um, and so over the past few years, I've been able to compile some data on body size, or we call it SDL, that's snout to vent length um, in these species. And sure enough, it, it did, I did confirm that the, the 
Santa Cruz Island gopher snake is indeed smaller than the mainland species on average. So here I've got females and males, and the Santa Cruz Island population, as you can see, much smaller body size. Um, so here's the data for um, the, the, the racer. Um, you can see that for both sexes, um, the island populations are also smaller. So females on the island are smaller than females on the mainland, and males on the island are smaller than males on the mainland. And furthermore, um, I also found a major size difference um, in the alligator lizards that are out on the island. So here's Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island. It's a little trickier to tell the sexes apart um, in this species. Um, and we're working on some strategies for that, but here sort of lumped together, you can see that they're um, considerably smaller on average than the parts. So I was pretty excited. I went out to study one dwarf, and then now it seemed like I could potentially study um, three dwarves out there. Um, and so we, we do measure their, 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 um, their body size. We also do some other uh, measurements, um, particularly of the head. It's always interesting to see how head shape um, kind of change on colonization of islands, because especially if they're eating different sized prey out there, um, that might cause selection for larger or smaller heads. And for the most part, we didn't see um, any big changes. Oh, well, actually, let me show you um, how we measure head size. So there's three main measurements we do, sort of head length, and then two width measurements, one at the widest point um, and one between the eyes. Um, and so it, it, with gopher snakes and alligator lizards, there doesn't seem to be too much difference um, between island and mainland. But in the racer, um, relative head length, so that means head length relative to the whole, entire body size, um, is actually considerably smaller on the island. So um, they're not only smaller, but they have smaller heads relative to their body size than the mainland one. And so we're interested in exploring why that might be. Is it because of the difference in prey, or are there other potential explanations uh, for that? So um, you may know that um, the Northern Channel Islands actually, um, uh, as many as nine to 10,000 years ago, were all one uh, island called Santa Rosa. And so we can actually um, look for fossils um, on these different islands um, and try to figure out when some of these animals um, got out there. And fossils from San Miguel Island suggest that um, both the alligator lizards and the gopher snakes have been out there for quite a long time. So there's um, fossils of alligator lizards that date back to 34,000 years ago, and uh, evidence that the gopher snakes were there at least 8,000 years ago. Um, this suggests that alligator lizards definitely colonized that area uh, pre-human habitation, so pre-Chumash. Um, we don't know if gopher snakes were there pre chumash or potentially, as is one of the major hypotheses for how the island fox got out there, possible that the chumash were also responsible for the colonization of the island by um, gopher snakes. Um, certainly, there's much more work that could be done to try to um, elucidate that. But my main point here is, is to emphasize that these animals, and I actually don't have informa fossil information on the racer, as I hope someday um, somebody will work on that, um, but these animals have been out there a long time, a long time um, such that evolution um, could occur. And so we think that these differences in body size between the island and mainland are probably evolved and not just um, what we call plastic, flexible resources to how much food is actually there. They have actually evolved a genetic difference um, in body size. So um, now I get to the second part of my talk, which sort of emphasizes the, the particular questions that we are interested in exploring in this system. So we've got three reptiles out there all of which are dwarf. And so we call that convergent evolution. Independently, these different lineages have converged on small body size. Um, and so a major question in evolutionary biology when you see convergence is whether um, species took um, the same path um, to that end or whether they took different paths. And so there's been a lot of different studies in, in different systems um, studying convergence that have suggested that you can have convergence through mutations to the same gene independently in different species. So let me give you some examples. Um, here is um, a great study system where they are studying the evolution of toxin resistance. Um, toxin, uh, salamander toxin, or let's say newt particularly, newt toxin resistance in garter snakes. There are several different species of garter snake that are able to eat highly toxic newts um, without keeling over and dying. 
whereas most garter snakes, if they eat them, um, will go into a neurological um, shock. Um, and so uh, the researchers who study this have tried to understand, okay, what's, what's different genetically about these species? And they've been actually able to isolate um, a particular protein that's involved in resistance that all three of these species, and you see in color here, that have resistance, they've all have mutations in highly functional parts of that protein. But they're, they're different ones, so they got them independently. But it's the same gene that they have mutations in that's altered its function that allows them to be resistant to the newts. Another example um, how, of how mutations, the same gene can um, be underlie convergence is in um, uh, domestic pigeons and then a wild um, relative, the ringneck dove. Both of them independently have um, evolved these crests on the back of their head. Uh, and these biologists have identified the gene that's responsible for those crests and again, it's the same gene in both of those species. And you can see there's different mutations here. That this is, this is the pigeon sequence. Um, and this is, uh, the, sorry, the wild type sequence. And this is the one with the crest. You can see this T mutation in the gene. And this is the wild type dove. And this is the one with the crest. You can see it's had a different mutation, but it's the same gene. Um, so we have examples like this, but we also have examples in the literature of convergence um, on a particular trait by mutations to different genes. So this is a particular study um, on the pocket mouse, which I highly um, recommend this Howard Hughes Medical Institute video that tells the story in more detail of the, of the pocket mouse. But these mice live um, either on lava rocks, which are very dark, um, or out on um, more sandstone, light-colored rocks. The ones living on the lava-colored rocks are dark, and the ones living on the sandstone are light-colored. Um, in this particular study, they studied two populations that seem to have convergently arrived on a dark um, color morph where there's lava. So an Arizona population and a New Mexico population both showing this dark morph um, and lava flows. And so they wanted to look at the genetic basis and see, have they had changes in the same gene or are different genes involved? And in this case, which you might be able to guess from the title of my slide, they found they found the gene that actually across species often is involved in, in color change at the Lanacortin 1 receptor. That had changed in the Arizona population, but they are still investigating what actually changed in the New Mexico one. It seems to be a different gene that's involved and not that one because that one's unchanged or not related um, to coat color variation. So um, I want to outline here the three questions that we're interested in asking in this system but I'm going to unpack them one by one um, in the rest of the talk. Um, so our first question is, can we see in our system convergent genetic and physiological mechanisms underlying dwarfism? Um, second, has there been convergent evolution of other life history traits, so things like reproduction or survival? And then third, has there been convergent evolution of behavior as well? So we're looking even beyond um, life history traits. Uh, before I dive into those, though, I want to make sure you have a little bit of a sense of what it looks like to do field work um, with these animals. So um, the best way often in many, in many areas to find um, reptiles, um, particularly snakes, which can be very secretive, is using cover boards. So we, we do a lot of... Um, flipping uh, plywood boards um, at our various uh, study sites. We've put some of them out ourselves. I actually love scrap. Piles of scrap anywhere are a treasure trove to a herpetologist, because chances are, if they've been there for a while, um, some snakes have colonized them. And I've been a little bit disturbed at how cleanly the national park is. Um, they've been cleaning up way too much junk. It's, it's very frustrating. So, um. uh, so when we uh, catch a snake, um, we do a number of things. Um, the first priority is to get a blood sample. Um, so we want to get that often within five minutes of capture um, because pretty quickly after capture, stress levels are just going crazy and we don't want anything we're measuring in the blood to be affected um, by the stress of capture. Um, so we take a blood sample, um, we put it in a tube, it's that tube immediately on ice, um, and after that, we ended up spinning it down in a field centrifuge. And you can separate out a blood sample into the plasma, which has the hormones and the immune factors and all lots of juicy stuff like that. 
um, and then a little blood pellet, which um, has DNA that we can use um, for genetic biology. So it's a tiny little blood sample that you can get tons of information from. Um, we also use just a tiny, like a microliter of blood from the syringe to measure blood glucose um, right on site using a handheld glucometer, which is the same. Some of you might have it if that's right. Um, and so those are the sort of the most urgent things um, we do um, pretty soon after that weigh and measure and do a, a variety of different sort of checks on the animal for different things establishing um, whether they're bre pregnant their sex etc um, and ultimately um, we, we do um, uh, clip um, their scales um, so snakes um, have belly scales that are sort of these um, horizontal rows and we can make tiny little clips um, that doesn't draw blood. Um, they don't even seem to really flinch when you do it. Um, but it, it scars over so that in subsequent years, you can read the pattern that you did in a, a numerical pattern and, and identify which that individual again. So these are things we do um, in order to um, pursue these particular questions. So um, this first question, are there convergent genetic and physiological mechanisms underlying dwarfism in these three channel island species. Our first stop in exploring this question is to understand what's going on with the growth hormone insulin, insulin-like signaling pathway, or call it the IIS pathway. Um, this is a major um, physiological pathway that is shared across vertebrates, you have it too, um, that regulates growth, um, development, and reproduction. Um, the reason we think this is a good stop uh, first stop for investigating the evolution of dwarfism is that there is overwhelming evidence in laboratory models, particularly mice and flies, um, that it's one of the major regulators of body size. So lots of evidence of that. Um, we also see that in artificially selected species that have been selected to be very large or very small, so dwarf species of chicken or dwarf lines of chicken um, or even small breeds of dog versus large breeds of dog, that the size difference, one of the major things that's regulating it is this um, insulin-like signaling. Um, we also do see in natural populations some as associations between changes in this pathway um, and, and small body size. So for instance, um, Laurent-type dwarfism shown here in humans is associated with a particular mutation in one of the parts of the insulin-like signaling pathway. And the first study in, in wild um, animals to uh, look at the evolution of gigantism in mice, and so these are gow island uh, mice that spend a lot of time eating seabirds. Um, they actually, their gigantism is at least partially explained by this insulin-like signaling pathway. So we think it's a good stop to see what kinds of changes might have occurred in this pathway in the island versus the mainland species. Um, a little bit more about this pathway, so it has um, roughly 70 different genes involved. Um, this is sort of what a, a signaling pathway can look like. It's, if you think about it, um, it it's something like if, if you topple over a domino, all the other domino will fall. That's sort of how a, a signaling network works. You have one molecule, one protein that will start off a whole set of signals that will then talk to each other. So maybe it's like tipping over a domino that's connected to five different rows of dominoes that all you know, go down their different paths. Um, and so some of the, the major players um, in this pathway are some, some hormones you might recognize. So insulin, a lot of people have heard of insulin, right, as being an important uh, hormone um, for regulating blood sugar. And then its friends, insulin, like growth factor one and two are two other hormones um, that are really key in the system. And then their receptors, which are the proteins on the membrane that they bind to in order to start signaling these other uh, molecules. And then also there's binding proteins that ferry them around in the blood and regulate how available they are to do their activities. And then, of course, inside, there's a variety of different um, proteins um, that we can look at as well um, in this pathway. And so our major goal here is to test if this pathway is evolving faster than the rest of the genome between island and mainland populations. And this is really sort of um, not only an interesting and new system to approach this in, but it's actually a pretty novel approach in evolutionary biology as well. The examples of studies I gave you are really focusing on one particular gene controlling one trait, and you know, looking at toxin resistance from one gene. Here we're talking about a complex trait, body size, that has complex 
uh, genetic components. And so we're looking at a whole bunch of different genes that might be involved in that. So um, just focusing on the genetic part, I, I want to tell you a little bit about where we are so far. We don't have answers yet. We're still very much in the beginning stages of this project. But we do already have DNA from more than 30 individuals per species from both mainland and island populations. We have many more um, for, than that, but that's at least the minimum. I think the lowest we have um, is 30 for just one population. Um, we have already sequenced the first draft Santa Cruz Island gopher snake genome, so we already have that in hand. We just got that data as of January 2017, and so it's, it's ready for these big computers to start searching um, for sequence, um, sequences of the genes that we're interested in. Um, and so our next step is to try to um, sequence those genes in this pathway um, so that we can compare populations. And ultimately, we, what we want to do with that data is to see whether these diff three different species that have evolved dwarfism are showing change, if they're all three showing changes in this pathway, and if they're similar kinds of changes uh, that they're showing. Um, so that's about the genetic mechanisms. When I say genetic versus physiological, those two are, are very tied together. So the genes code for the proteins that do the work. Um, so you can look at the genes themselves um, and how they've changed, but you can also look at the proteins and how they're, they're acting. Um, and so when we take a blood sample, we can, we can measure levels of, of, of different, the different hormones I mentioned. Um, we, ha we have blood samples queued up to that. We're still developing species-specific uh, ways of measuring them. We do have preliminary data on blood glucose, um, which we predict um, that, that if there's l really low prey availability out on the islands that has favored the evolution of dwarfism, we would expect these animals to have lower blood glucose levels. So less to eat, lower blood sugar. Make sense? Um, uh, now, though it's also possible that it, it doesn't even fluctuate based on how much they eat every year, it's possible that by evolving dwarfs, then they just maintain it at very low levels. Um, so here's what we found so far. Um, in the gopher snake, we find, just as predicted, in two years of sampling, 2015 and 2016, the Santa Cruz Island um, snakes have lower um, blood glucose. Um, couldn't really believe that it. it just came out. We sort of predicted it um, as this major endpoint in the insulin-like signaling pathway. Um, and lo and behold, they had lower blood glucose. Now, interestingly, in, in the, um, the racer, we had different patterns in the different years. Um, sometimes ecologists get different patterns in different years, and they just wish they had stopped with the first one, because it said what they liked, and then they go back, and it's a little different. But really, the world is just very complex, and so we need to keep going out and looking to add, forward to adding more years to the sampling. But at any rate, in, in 2015, there actually wasn't any difference. But in 2016, there was a big difference between islands and islands. Um, with the alligator lizard, um, they're actually, overall, the, I, the island populations did have lower blood glucose, but in 2015, it was less pronounced um, than in 2016. So just to summarize this, in 2015, the only species that had lower blood glucose was the um, gopher snake. In 2016, though, all three species had lower blood glucose on the island. Um, so what this suggests to us um, is that there are definitely physiological differences between island and mainland populations. They're experiencing different things. Um, and if anyone's lower, it's, it's usually the island one, um, as we would predict. But it's possible that some of these fluctuations we're seeing from year to year have to do with the trout, drought. And in particular, a lot of this data is from, on the mainland, is from um, more northern populations, which got a lot more um, rainfall earlier than we did. Um, and so they may have recovered from the drought to more greater extent last year, and so their blood glucose level went up to maybe where they might be more often in non-drought years. So that sort of is, is our approach and the questions we're interested in asking um, for our first question. Our second major question is about whether other traits have also changed in tandem with body size. And so um, one thing we're interested in looking at is survival. So by marking these animals and then recapturing them over time, we can use models to actually infer what their survival rate is. Um, and that takes many years of data. 
Um, you can also um, look at growth rate if you're able to recapture individuals over the years. And so we're just, you know, we're just at the beginning of the study, so we certainly don't have many years of data, but I can show you a couple examples. Um, so here's a, a little guy that I caught last week again for the third time. Um, and you can see that his snout vet length has considerably increased since he, when he was, when I caught him in 2015, he was just a skinny little one. Um, but he's done about 50 to 70 millimeters a year in the last three years. And I'm looking forward to seeing if I can get him again next year and see where he's gone. So this is a, a juvenile on the island, sort of at, at the peak of his growth rate. In contrast, here are the female that we caught um, in 2015 and 2016. We caught her in May both years. So I'm still hoping for a May um, capture. And you can see that she, she's actually the largest um, island gopher snake I've caught her. She was a giant. Uh, even though she was not compared to the, to the mainland ones. And she stayed about 800. So she basically looks like she maybe has, has leveled off and isn't growing so much anymore. So by, these are just a couple examples, but by accumulating more data like this and more individuals, we're hoping to calculate sort of average um, growth rates and get a sense of not just that they're smaller, but how quickly they get to adult size. Um, the other major life history trait that we're interested in is reproduction. So we want to know how many babies do they have, and are those babies smaller than the main one ones? Um, do they have fewer young than the main one ones? Um, and we're not really interested in bringing these animals into captivity. We'd like to determine this in the wild. And so we've been um, started using a field portable ultrasound, which I'm very excited about as a tool for answering these kinds of questions. Um, so basically, um, you, can, you can carry this ultrasound anywhere. It's a bit heavy, but uh, you can carry it around and you just uh, hold the animal um, gently in a water path and, and scan them with this transducer and you can move it all along their body um, and count the number of eggs. You can actually um, measure them in there. Um, these are all egg-bearing species, so um, probably won't see too much development, in, but in the garter snakes I use the ultrasounds on, you can actually see the little embryos developing uh, inside the mother. So it's a really powerful um, tool. So we just used it for the first time last year out there. And we were, it's a little bit dark I think, here, but you, you can see this is alligator lizard eggs. They're sort of like in a honeycomb fat fashion um, arranged there. And so we, we counted about 10 eggs in this individual. Um, and here is uh, one uh, long egg um, in a racer. Um, so we were able to measure and count them um, in these individuals. Um, the, when we were out there using this, unfortunately, it was prior to the season, it seems that um, the gopher snake um, was reproductive. So we're still, we have to figure out when these different species are actually reproductive. And it turns out it's different than on the mainland. So we're still in the middle of, of actually figuring out when we can go out and get this data. And so I, um, I hope in the next few years we're going to have a, uh, some pretty nice data comparing these two populations for all three species. Um, so the, the third major question that we're interested in exploring is um, the evolution of behavior. So you might think dwarfism, behavior, what do those have in common? Um, and certainly behavior can evolve independently of things like body size, but there can be relationships between the two. Um, there's something called the island syndrome that has been described um, most um, clearly in rodents um, upon uh, colonization of islands. They tend to get larger. They tend to live longer, and they tend to have fewer young. Um, those are some life history traits, but on the usually associated with that is the fact that they tend to have low dispersal, so they, they don't go very far from home, from where they're born. Uh, it's actually a common feature in island species. The idea is sort of high dispersal rate might be favored to actually get out to an island, um, but once you're out there, if you go far from home, you might just drop into the ocean. Um, and so there's selection against it, and in plants as well, right? So this has been a common trend in plants, selection against um, dispersing your seeds too far. Uh, but we see the same thing in rodents. Um, they also tend to live at much higher densities um, and be less aggressive, and perhaps related to that living in higher densities, sort of an adaptation to um, being more sociable um, if you're encountering more individuals. So um, we're interested in a variety of different types of behaviors um, in the island reptiles. Um, aggressive behavior, um, exploratory behavior, social behavior, anti-predator behavior. It's a lot we um, hope to explore with these species. Um, some preliminary um, behavioral tests that I've been doing are in this um, 
by placing an animal into uh, just a bin, it, which would be a novel environment for them. So you just place them at the bottom of the bin. And then they, the idea is that you can assess exploratory behavior, admittedly in a stressful situation, right? They've just been held by a human. So it's in some level sort of anti-predator exploratory behavior, probably looking for an escape route um, in that bucket. And, and there's two major behaviors that it's, it's relatively easy to quantify um, if you take videotapes of these trials. And one is how many times they click their tongues, because that's a major way that they're exploring and collecting information of their about their environment. And the other is how much they actually move. Um, and so here's some of the data that uh, we have on this so far. Um, and here's the racer. Um, you can see I have this split out by um, islands are the light and mainland are the dark. I've got females here and males here. Um, and there's definitely an island mainland difference for a number of tongue clicks. So the islands seem to be clicking their tongues less uh, if they're female, but not if they're male. Um, this looks at the percent that moved. So basically, there was a pretty, I was thinking I would sort of quantify rate of movement, but for most animals, it was sort of they moved or they didn't. <laughs> Um, you put them in, they were totally inert, or they explored quite a bit. And for both sexes, really, the island ones were just less, a lot less likely to move at all. So we also did these trials with um, the alligator lizard. Um, and here we looked at a um, number of tongue clicks as well. And we found an uh, island mainland difference that was very strong. But if you notice here, it's in exactly the opposite direction as we saw for the snake. And so it looks like the island ones are actually tongue clicking more, and they're also moving more. So this is percent with uh, more than 15 steps, because they kind of, some of them would take a few steps and then not do very much. Some wouldn't move at all, but others would just be walking all around the edges. Um, and usually the ones walking all around the edges exploring it were the island ones. So what this suggests to us is that a far from seeing convergence in these behaviors, um, in these two dwarves, we're seeing the opposite um, behavior. So that's really interesting to us. Um, and what it suggests is that, is that different species and even different sexes may be experiencing different patterns of selection on behavior in this same island environment. So even though they live in the same place, they experience a lot of the same selective pressures, they might be experiencing them diff in different ways and responding to them in different ways. So, that's just to give you a sense of, of sort of where we've come so far, where we hope to go. Um, and we're just thrilled about all the possibilities um, in exploring this fascinating system um, in a beautiful, beautiful place to work. Um, so I'd like to make some acknowledgments as I, I finish up here. I particularly want to acknowledge all of my undergraduate research students that have poured so much love and time and energy into this work. I could not do it without them. And so I've had a number. Um, of excellent students through the years. Mindy Chow, um, Kenny Chisholm, McKenna Musson, uh, uh, Stephanie Brooks, Brooke Hobbs, um, uh, Ben West, uh, Nicole Carver, Kira Kaufman, and Nicole Cavey right here. Um, wonderful, wonderful out in the field. Um, also, this is my collaborator, Tanya Schwartz, and her graduate student, Amanda Clark, who are going to bring this project in so many interesting directions, doing the, a lot of the genetic um, work. I also want to sort of broadly acknowledge um, the Southern California Research Learning Center for um, funding some of the early stages of this work. Um, Brian Guerrero at the UCSB Field Station, who really wanted me to find those animals when I was out there for the first time, and it was hard. Um, and without his support, I would never have, have continued research out there. Also, Lyndall out at the Field Station has been, has been wonderful, and I'm really grateful to the Nature Conservancy for allowing uh, me to work out there. Paula Power um, for all of her support um, from the National Park side. Um, Cos Hanna at the Santa Rosa Island Field Station has been wonderful. And a variety of um, uh, collaborators in my mainland sites. Um, museum contacts, um, Paul Collins and Greg Polly have been wonderful. Greg Polly actually independently observed um, the dwarfism himself and has some really great um, data on that um, that I hope he'll, he'll be publishing. Um, Eric Ginglock helped me with the Bay Behavioral Assays. And ultimately, I want to also acknowledge um, my sister, who is a wildlife photographer, who is responsible for a number of the pictures in this presentation. So thank you very much for listening.
Thank you so much. I, that was a lot of information. I'm really excited about it now. <laughs> um, so we're going to turn it over to our question and answer period. Um, and just as a reminder, if you want to wait until I come to you with the mic, um, but hopefully I'll have a lot of cool questions. So, yeah. Do you have an idea how long your study is going to go? Any idea? I, so, you know, my training is working with long-term studies. So the, the garter snakes I study in the Sierras have been studied for over 40 years now. And we still have lots of questions to ask about them. So I think of projects as career long. And I really think there's a way of, of getting to know populations if you go year after year and study them intensively that just short-term research projects can't give you. So, um, yeah, I, I hope to study them indefinitely. So in 2037, we'll have her back. Right? <laughs> right. I hope to have, you know, some, some progress along the way, right? Uh, but um, lots of, I, I feel like there's lots of questions to explore. Some of us lead hikes on the islands. Uh, is there a way that we can collaborate with you if we start seeing snakes and lizards and things like that? <laughs> well, there might be some tricky, tricky permitting issues there. Um, you know, a lot of people have offered, you know, just, I see a gopher snake, should I just grab it for you um, on the mainland as well? I actually need to get those blood samples myself within, you know, five minutes of capture. And so kind of I, I need to be there um, in order to get the animal, though I certainly appreciate um, offers of help that, I, that I've had. I was thinking more of uh, just seeing where there are populations. Oh, just where you've seen them? Oh, absolutely. I would love to hear any reports of where, where you've seen them. Yeah, definitely. You, you mentioned one of the, you were talking about one of the snakes and you, you were able to capture it a couple, three times. Do they move a whole lot? Do they have big territories or? Well, that's something I'm interested in. And I, I have the sense that on the islands, they're pretty sedentary, a lot of them are. So the first animals I captured, um, I hadn't found anything for three days I was there and I was about to give up. This was the first time I went out to the Channel Islands. A lot of people told me, oh, I've been out here for 10 years and I've seen two or something. It was kind of discouraging. but. It was this pile of scrap, and there were um, three corpses and four live animals under there. And those are ones I've been consistently recapturing over the years, the same individuals living under that tin. Um, now, certainly there can be examples of that on the mainland. So I've, I, my experience on the mainland is that if you find a gopher snake, it's usually alone. Maybe if it's with, with somebody it's mating with or something, you find two, but usually they're alone. It seems unusual to me to be finding groups of gopher snakes under the same board. So I definitely think there can be more sedentary behavior. And um, by the way, I didn't mention, so that looks like that's true even just in terms of exploratory, exploration for the racers. I've tried to do these behavioral assays with the gopher snakes, and it looks, works really well on the islands. On the mainland, the big ones just pop right out of my, my bin. <laughs> so I, I don't know to what extent um, exploration is different. But I would expect that they're just like we've seen Selection against dispersal, maybe, and movement in, in mice um, and, and rodents in general. Maybe we've also we're seeing that um, in these species as well. Online. Yeah. Yes, I have, I have two questions. Basically, first, when you um, your study didn't deal with the, the two other lizards, are, is that because yeah. uh, they do not? Uh, are not involved with dwarfism? Are you just, right? Uh, Great question. So I'm. I'm I haven't captured as many of them. I'm fairly certain the island fence lizard is not dwarf. I, Which one? The, the, fe the fence lizard is not dwarf. Oh, okay. I feel like I haven't seen enough of the mainland side watch ones um, to really say. It might be interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I bet that um, Greg Pauly from the LA Natural History Museum has some data on that. I haven't actually asked him. That would be interesting to. Uh, the second question, I, obviously, the gopher snake doesn't eat gophers, so their main uh, their main food would. would be the mice? Well, I suspect it's mice, but potentially also other lizards. So I actually, it's very rare for me to find them with food lumps, we call them. I actually find that a lot more often in the mainland states, and that might actually speak to low resource availability. But that, that baby there had an enormous food lump last week. And so I ultrasounded it. And there was a very long vertebrae in there. I kind of think it was an alligator lizard. I'm not positive. Um, but I'm hoping if I can refine some of my ultrasound techniques, I might be able to identify some other prey. Hi. Uh, oh, back there. Okay. Hello. Right. Hi. <laughs> um, you said that you mentioned that there was a possible difference in some of the levels that you were getting 
through their blood through the different drought years. Yeah, Are uh-huh. you excited to see with this kind of high rainfall that we've had yes. to see what those differences might be and what you can infer from those? Yes. I'm, I'm so they're going out multiple years with different sort of environmental contexts. I'm really hoping to see whether there's a link between that and the glucose levels. And actually my project, uh, my research project in the Sierras is looking at those particular questions with, with, we have you know years and years of data with drought um, and wet years, and we're trying to see okay, how does that affecting snake physiology? How is that affecting their survival and reproduction? How does that affect whether that population actually persists or goes extinct? And so I'm asking those questions with this other system, but I would love to that to become a part of this system as well, just because I'm out there every year, you know, um, getting these same sort of measures. Other questions? Thank you. I have a few questions if if there's time. So one I was wondering, um, where were you studying the herps on the mainland? Um, Two, I'm wondering if you had any um, decision making in terms of the color of the bucket in which you placed the herps in terms of determining whether or not they would be more likely or less likely to move. And three, I'm wondering if your boards were both tin and wood. <laughs> wow, okay, let's see if I can keep track of those. The mainland uh, field sites, primarily the um, Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, and you know, certainly when I catch gopher snakes or alligator lizards um, in Santa Barbara, I am also include them. Um, I, a large part of my sample is from San Mateo County up north, um, because all three of my focal species live up there. The racers are very rare down here, and so it's hard it's hard to get them. But I'm trying to sort of broadly sample across sort of a range of mainland habitats, and they all are large body size. Um, um, let's see, the second question was about the color of the bucket. So I chose white because um, in the, with the video camera, you can see the tug flick really clearly. Um, so it, it's, yeah, definitely an interesting question to think about. There, there could be different color preferences, um, and that could be another area to think, you know, are there differences in, in sensory abilities or preferences between species that might make them behave differently in that context? Um, but I, I don't have any a priori reason to think that that would be the case. Um, the third question, what was it? Tin versus wood oh, tin on versus, the oh, boards. I, I use both. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, they work sort of differently for different species um, and different times of year um, as well. But I'm still sort of figuring out what's, what's best. Um, it's very much a, a learning process. Um, Santa Rosa, for instance, has been a real challenge for me to, to get the gopher snakes under my boards. The alligator snakes love them. Um, but Santa Rosa is way too clean, is the thing. <laughs> um, so Because a lot of times, it, it may take years for the boards I put out to get seasoned enough for the animals to really colonize them. So I love things that have been out there for a while. Um, but the alligator lizards are way less picky, so that's, that's fine. Any other questions? Okay, so the mainland versus the island, are they interfertile? Um, no idea. Um, so you would have to put them together and see if you could produce offspring in that. And to my knowledge, nobody's tried that. Um, I, I personally um, don't like to bring animals into captivity for, for research, and so that would require a captive um, kind of context in order to explore that. But certainly, that's an interesting question of whether species can hybridize. Are they, are they separate species? Right now, we think of the gopher snake as a subspecies. Um, yeah, I, there could be mechanical difficulties with body size, but maybe not. Maybe there's going to be enough overlap. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. But that's a, a good question, and potentially we could get at that to some extent genetically to see if there's any evidence. Well, no, we couldn't in that system because they haven't been, haven't had an opportunity to natural hybridize. In mainland populations, you can usually see, look at overlap and see if they're hybridizing based on genetic methods. But we wouldn't be able to do that. So. Yeah, uh, good question. Don't know. Okay, and then um, <laughs> second part: uh, when you're measuring the glucose levels, can't that fluctuate within the day? Oh, so absolutely. So we're sort of thinking of it as an av- on average, right? On average, are the island ones different than on average in the mainland? So we're just assuming that all of that fluctuation is going to be taken into account. So yeah, it's a very plastic um, measure. Yeah. I just wondered if you had. Um, um, what your reasoning was to pick 
the species that you did and if you had an overarching premise that you were looking at or is it still the specific to that you know to the species of what you explained tonight um, I, I think so I, my, my ba one of my major research areas has historically been trying to understand why species have different body sizes. So in the natural world, we see so many different body sizes, some species that have lots of babies, some that have very few, some that live very long lives, some that live short lives. And so when I, when I heard about there being a dwarf gopher snake sort of in my backyard or my front yard, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to explore how that's happened in this species and then sort of grown as I realized, okay, there's three species. So that makes it even a richer system to look at. Yeah. Hi, um, I go, we go out there a lot and I hike around. I've seen snakes and I remember seeing once or twice the solid color ones. They're the racers. Yeah, yeah. so the gray. And, and then in like holes in the rocks along the, the roadway, there'd be a hole uh -huh. kind of. And, and, and you look in there and you'd be cooled up and kind of looking. Oh, okay. Like, nice. please don't. Uh, but anyway, that's where I saw him out there at Little Scorpion. But the question was, how do you draw blood on a snake? How Good do you question. find that vein? Yeah. Um, so I have to say, this is one of the skills that I'm very proud of. I am an excellent snake bleeder. <laughs> I have bled thousands of snakes, and you do it through the through the tail. So they have veins in their tail, and so you just sort of poke sort of in the center of the tail, and you can tap right into the vein. It's uh, I, I make it sound easy. It's, it's a bit of an art. Um, it's kind of a weird skill to be proud of. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so and you can, and we take, you know, what was that? Oh, really? Well, then, and so you totally get that. Yes. I always, um, whenever I go to a phlebotomist and they're having tr a little trouble, you know, finding the vein, I always say, it's okay. Sometimes I have a little trouble with the reptiles, too. <laughs> Yeah, the, the lizards can be more challenging than, than the snakes. The snakes are much easier for me. The lizards are that much smaller, and so it can be a little more challenging. But I, I usually can get it within a few minutes. But, you know. yeah. Is the blue belly lizard the same as the fence lizard? Yes. It, okay. Yes, yes. Scolopterus okay. oxentalis, um, and it's Scolopterus oxentalis becci in the island. Okay. You guys are giving me a workout. <laughs> you had mentioned um, a delayed breeding season with one of the snakes. Um, yeah. And I was just kind of curious about, have you been seeing that across the species you've been studying? Does some of it have to do, do you have an idea of climate change or drought? Um, Those good, really good questions. Yeah, uh, so we just started last year using this, ultrasound systems. And this is really the first time people have been using ultrasound reptiles in the wild. So this is all very new. And, and for most species, we don't know exactly when they're breeding. So it's hard to compare to any past data. So what I'm hoping is that we, you know, first of all, we just need for our qu study questions, we need to figure out when they're breeding. Um, but that might be changing. Um, certainly, again, I, I can refer to the, the garter snake populations have been using the ultrasound up there for, for three years, uh, or for two years. And we've already seen between last year and uh, so two years ago and this year, they they were um, more advanced. So they the, the last year was a very warm year, and they'd actually shifted their developmental stages earlier. And so I think through any of these snake systems and, and lizard systems, as we start collecting this data, we'll start being able to assess those kinds of trends. And I'm very interested in whether um, there is going to be changes in climate. I think we're certainly seeing that in birds. Um, and you know other groups that are maybe a little easier to send their reproduction. Um, don't tell a bird biologist I said that. Um, uh, but I'm I'm sure those kinds of things are happening in reptiles who are very thermally sensitive. Uh, I'm just wondering if you think there's any connection between the dwarfism and the population density. Like on the mainland, is it a lot easier to find the, the samples or? Is that anything you're tracking? Yeah, so, so what, yeah, I mean, one of those major hypotheses for dwarfism involves resource availability. And it could be that if they're at higher densities, um, there's more competition w among individuals. And so even if there's the same amount of resources, there's more mouths to feed. And so that could be a reason why they have evolved dwarfism, definitely. Yeah. Or, are we done? Or? <laughs> Uh, related to that, have you seen a difference in the relationships of uh, 
between mainland and islands to uh, hibernation? Um, so okay, I'm not out there enough, I, I don't think, at this point to, to be able to say that. Like, I, I have to sort of be out there, I think, every month at all of my sites to get a sense of who's coming out when. Um, but I sort of suspect that some of my mainland populations are emerging a little later um, just because reproduction is happening a little bit later. So that's an assumption, but um, I hope that those kinds of, so really in, in doing a lot of this research, I have my theoretical questions I'm interested in, but I really wanna learn a lot of these natural history type of questions um, that I think are so important that are fascinate me and really keep me energized about studying biology. And that I think ultimately can be really useful for managing these species in a time when so many species are, are threatened. Awesome. Well, I think that's the first time that somebody has complained about the cleanliness of our park. Um, <laughs> but we'll try to keep some scrap out there for you. <laughs> so please join me again in thanking Dr. Sparkman for being here tonight. <laughs> <laughs>